this video is about the killer whale. You might be wondering, why am I dressed up like a penguin? I don't know either. Let's get on to the video. The killer whale is the lord of the seas. It's named Orca, which means of the kingdom of the dead. This is after Orcus, the Roman god of death, which is the Roman equivalent of the Greek god Thanatos, which if it sounds familiar, it's because that's where we get Thanos from. Anyways, the orca has a fearsome reputation, first called killer whales, because fishers and sailors actually observe them hunting other whales for prey. But these animals are not really just whales, they're dolphins. And in fact, they are the largest members of the dolphin family. While they are technically toothed whales, they are in the family of Odontoceti, suborder Delphinidae, which is the oceanic dolphins. So, a couple characteristics about these creatures. Orcas grow up to about 32 feet long, a far cry from that of the blue whale, the largest whale, which can reach up to 100 feet long. Fun fact though, orcas actually can't smell at all. In fact, orcas completely lack olfactory nerves or lobes in their brain. They make up for this with incredible hearing, vision, and touch. The most important of these is hearing. Orcas can detect minute sounds from up to 10 miles away. A powerful adaptation all dolphins have developed is called echolocation. Orcas, like other dolphins, have fatty deposits on their heads called melons, which emit high ultrasonic sounds. These sounds then bounce off other objects, bouncing back, returning to the orca, and giving it a sense of where things are relative to the sound. I call it a form of biological sonar that is surprisingly accurate and oddly precise. So the orca has amazing sensory abilities, but there's more to this story than meets the eye. Orcas have to consider how other creatures will sense them, namely how they will camouflage to attack their unsuspecting prey. Ever wondered why certain animals are darker on the top and lighter colored on their bodies? Great white sharks also exhibit this pattern. To understand this pattern, you have to understand yourself as a fish in the ocean. Imagine yourself, all right? You're in the pelagic zone, so in the open ocean, not too deep, but not too shallow. You can see the light coming from the top of the water, the gentle rays radiating down past you and into the deep below. A predator above you in the white would blend in with the light coming from above. Now imagine you're looking down beneath you in the ocean. It's darker below, so a white object would totally stand out like a sore thumb. A black object on the other hand beneath you would camouflage it from your vision as it blends in with the linear perspective and the lack of light below. This is why orcas like military airplanes are actually white on their bellies and black on their dorsal side. Now there are exceptions to this coloration rule. In 2012, the killer whale Iceberg was filmed by the Far East Russia project. Now Iceberg was a completely white whale and had no pigmentation, but current evidence suggests that he actually is an albino. His eyes are completely normal, not with a reddish hue. Instead, he probably has a special condition we call leucism which is caused by a mutation that simply removes pigmentation. Notable examples like this have also been seen since then. In August 14th of 2020, researchers out of Southeast Alaska spotted a white orca with his or her pod. Other sightings have also been confirmed in the last 20 years. Either way, what's the point? Well, the evidence suggests that not all orcas are the traditional colors that we've come to know and love. Sometimes, not everything is black and white. Now let's talk about where the orca is truly exceptional. Fascinatingly enough, orcas are also the most widespread mammal in the world besides, you guessed it, humans. They can be found from the Arctic to the Antarctic in warm waters and freezing waters alike. Some orcas have even been spotted in freshwater rivers, including the Rhine and Columbian rivers. As orcas have no predators, they are the apex predators of wherever they go. No other sharks or whales have been known to eat them at all. You might call these the apex apex predators. But orcas are not simply cold-blooded murder machines. Orcas are also very social. Let's go from the smallest social unit and move on up from there. Every orca is part of a pod, which is the closest thing to a human family. Each pod speaks with a distinct dialect and accent. Several pods together make a clan, and each clan travels together. Each clan speaks an entirely different language to other clans, and several clans which ally and communicate make a community. And living in communities is more like humans than most other animals that we know. Only three species of animals continue to survive after they are no longer capable of having offspring, 
These species are humans, pilot whales, and orcas. Every single other animal can procreate up until their death. So why is this the case? Why are we different? Well, the grandmother hypothesis explains this phenomenon, that a female will forego creating new offspring to ensure a better life for the ones that she already has. This is kind of nature's way of ensuring quality of existing kids and grandkids and not just spitting out a quantity of offspring. Orcas are extremely intelligent and have been seen doing some crazy things. They'll find ways to abuse the tide to knock a seal off of a rock for an easy snack. They'll beach themselves to bait seals to attack them and then kill and run. Orcas are the only animals also other than humans that have been shown to harbor culture-specific gene maps. I know that sounds complicated, but it really isn't. It means that groups of orcas from a different region have a separate culture and a separate genomic identity. It's baked into their genes. Researchers took DNA from orcas in across the Antarctic and Pacific Oceans. And what they found was amazing, that there were consistent genes specific to individual cultures of orcas, like humans. Additionally, scientists have also found that orcas are not even technically just one species. That's right, the IUCN, or the organization responsible for giving taxonomic categories and classifying different species, said this in 2008. The taxonomy of this genus is clearly in need of review, and it is likely that Orsinus orca will be split into a number of different species, or at least subspecies, over the next few years. Indeed, there are multiple types of killer whales that we've observed over the last 200 years. These orcas don't appear to interbreed at all, and they're definitely genetically distinct. We call these classifications ecotypes. It's time to meet the different personalities of orcas. Within the Northern Hemisphere, we have three different types of orcas. The first type is called the resident. Resident orcas are fish specialists that target large fish schools. They usually don't move from home to home, only to follow these large fish communities. They stalk them. They mostly eat salmon, but also eat other fish like mackerel, halibut, and cod. Resident orcas live in family groups in massive social communities. Kids live with their moms their entire adult lives. Northern resident orcas in the Northern Hemisphere, in the very north, have an interesting habit of rubbing their bellies on beaches. They're not sure why they do this. Maybe to scratch themselves? Bigs orcas, or transient orcas, are another of the three types of the Northern Hemisphere. They are almost exclusively mammal-eating orcas, unlike their resident counterparts, and frequently travel large distances. Unlike the resident orcas, transient orcas live in smaller groups and may not always stay with their mothers for their entire adult lives. Transient orcas are particularly at risk for pollution because they accumulate so much pollutants amplified through the food web and end up with toxins all over their bodies. The last type in the northern hemisphere of orcas is called the offshore orca. Now, this type is a little bit mysterious, so we don't know too much about them as they live far away from land and usually travel in groups of more than 50 individuals. These orcas have been documented killing fish and sharks. A common indicator of offshore orcas are worn down or eroded teeth, which means that they're eating prey with hard skin. Offshore orcas are also the smallest of the three North Pacific ecotypes. They are, by genetic analysis, more closely related to resident orcas than to big transient orcas, but all three types are definitely genetically distinct to each other. So that's the Northern Hemisphere. Let's move to our friends within the Southern Hemisphere. Within the Southern Hemisphere, there are five ecotypes of orcas that are observed. Type A orcas are extremely large, documented up to 31 feet long. These generally are found in the open pelagic zones of the Southern Ocean and are known to specifically target minke whales, stalking their migration. Type B large orcas are also, as the name suggests, quite large and are sometimes called pack ice orcas. These orcas are the ones who famously use their bodies to wash seals straight off of icebergs. Type B orcas also have special diatom algae on their skin and so they often appear brown or yellow with some discoloration. Now there's another type of orca called type B small orcas, which are otherwise called Gerlache orcas. This ecotype lives in the Gerlache Strait of the Antarctic Peninsula and are smaller than both type A and pack B ice orcas. They are also called type B because they have that brown and yellow diatom discoloration and this type is usually seen hunting penguin colonies. It's not great for me. Type C orcas are the smallest ecotype in the Southern Hemisphere. Their nickname is the Ross Sea Orca. 
Males reach a max length of about 20 feet or 6 meters. Their diatom coating also gives them a yellow discoloration, but their cape is significantly darker than the other orcas. They also have a prominent and dramatic slanted eye patch and have been seen mostly eating Antarctic toothfish. I didn't even know what a toothfish was until I saw it, but here's what it looks like. Their main food source is still primarily unknown. Type D orcas or sub-Antarctic orcas are the fifth ecotype in the Southern Hemisphere. Initially, when New Zealand researchers encountered type Ds back in the 1950s, they were thought to be a mutated orca species. They're not like any other orcas. They're black and white, but unlike the other ones, this rare type also has shorter dorsal fins, rounder heads, and extremely small eye patches. We're still not sure about their food source as well, but we do know that they've been documented to eat Patagonian toothfish. So if you thought that people were confusing enough with their Enneagram Type 3, ENFP, Gryffindor Ravenclaw, Banana Peanut, personality quizzes, orcas also certainly have their own systems of type classification, and potentially even more so than humans. Some of these ecotypes are so different that they could be likely called a different species. But what's the moral of the story? Well, orcas are beautiful, fascinating creatures with extremely advanced intelligence, functional capacities, and social interactions. In a sense, they are probably among the most human-like creatures in the world, depending on your definition. But certainly, they are amazing creatures. There's no question about that. In recent years, more backlash has been given to select institutions for putting orcas in captivity for human recreation. This has pushed these creatures back up to the international spotlight and kind of protected them under the support of animal rights groups all across the world. The National Oceanographic and Atmospheric Administration, or NOAA in the US, fully protects all populations of killer whales under the Marine Mammal Protection Act. Internationally, however, it's a little more dicey. Their populations are officially protected by the International Whaling Commission, yet Norway, Japan, and Russia had previously hunted orcas until the 1980s. They now don't do as much, but there are still reports of illegal hunting going on in these countries and beyond. But are orcas dangerous to humans? The answer is no, not at all. While in the wild, there is only one instance of an orca attack on a human, and this one case has largely been disproven as a case of mistaken identity for a seal. Unlike sharks who might take a bite out of a swimmer but then spit them out because they don't taste good, the orca's echolocation and sensing is so good that they will probably avoid humans much more accurately and consistently. However, in captivity, orcas are significantly more aggressive and have on demonstrated occasions killed their trainers or wounded civilians. This goes to show that it is still really important to consider carefully our role as humans in the vast ecosystems that we participate in. Moral and ethical considerations must be made for the lives of other creatures as well. Think of them as our roommates. But enough about the negative Nancys. Today, many orca populations are recovering very well under the protection of local and international law. It's my expressed hope that future generations of divers and ocean lovers will be able to enjoy the company and observe these creatures as well. Let me share with you guys a really cute story. In 2004 in Eden, Australia, 50 killer whales led by a large orca they called Old Tom would drive in whales tactically and begin attacking them for prey. After a humpback whale had been trapped by their encirclement movements, the orcas would signal to Tom, who would slap his big tail and breach the water to alert the whalers and humans to finish off the kill. There are also significant stories of fishermen falling into shark infested waters and Tom's team of orcas swimming in circles around them to protect them from the encroaching sharks. However, it is not all fun and games. In 1923, a local whaler made Tom really angry after refusing to share his catch with them, and they were pulling a whale. And after pulling so hard on the whale that it broke old Tom's teeth, the pod stopped helping the humans, almost like workers on strike. Tom died in 1930 as a hero of Eden in Australia. Today, the Eden Killer Whale Museum stands in testament to Tom's legacy and features his story proudly. The indigenous people of Eden, Australia, known as the Kaori, are believed to have worked in harmony with these whales for more than 10,000 years. They are no strangers to humans and sometimes good friends to us too. That was an excerpt from The Killer Whale Who Changed the World. It's a really interesting read that talks about our complex relationship with the orca whales within our history. 
I would really recommend checking it out if you love killer whales like me. Link is in the description below. There have also been other stories of orcas picking humans up from the water to save them from drowning. And there are so many other examples of amazing encounters with these fascinating creatures, but I just don't have enough room in this video to talk about all of them. But that's it for today. I hope you enjoyed today's episode. Today's question, which do you want me to cover next? The elusive blue ringed octopus or the terrifying cone snail? Drop a comment below, letting me know which one you prefer. As always, thumbs if you liked it, subs if you loved it. Check out our marine conservation apparel store, link below, moretis.com in the description box, to cop some sustainable merch, support the ocean, and recycle plastics away from the ocean. We have just released a new product called the Killer Whale Hoodie. So I hope you guys will check that out, and um, any purchases that you guys make will go directly to Oceana International in part as well as help to recycle plastics from the ocean while supporting this YouTube channel. Well, clean vibes, clean looks, clean oceans. Thank you guys so much for watching and I'll catch you next time. Penguin out.